committee will come to order. I want to thank you all for your patience. Uh, as members return, they will be called uh, by their seniority in the order in which they arrive. I will now recognize myself for a first round of questions. Ms. Miller, in your case, many of your employees are exactly the people who didn't have health care unless they had a job that provided health care. Isn't that true? Yes, and sir. I'm going to ask you a question that I asked in this morning's hearing. If Obamacare had said that you have to give $2,000 to every one of your employees, whether they wanted it or not, in the form of a health savings account that they could spend any way they wanted, but that you had to give that or be taxed, would you be here today? No, sir. Mr. Frederick? I would much rather put cash in the hands of people, and that will encourage a private sector market. Absolutely. Mr. Richardson? Yeah, we would feel the same way. Dr. Gooden, I know yours is a, an economic question. Well, let me ask you the other question, though. When you look at the uncertainty, if, the, if in fact Obamacare said that you have to not cost shifts, so you have to provide a minimum amount of dollars intended to prevent if you will, total uninsured behavior, would we have lowered the, un the uncertainty by having, instead of 12,000 pages of new regulations and growing out of a 2,400-page document, if we had simply had a very straightforward, no cost shifting uh, provision without a mandate of various and sundry? Would that have dramatically lowered or eliminated the uncertainty that came out of Obamacare? that led to what you see as a loss of jobs uh, being created? Well, I am not quite sure what you have in mind, but what we could do In other words, if there was certainty as to the cost of Obamacare, sure. yeah. regardless of what it was, I used 2,000, because that is the amount that employers know they can just pay and get out from underneath it, but it doesn't change the total cost of, of Obamacare because of the 21 other taxes and so on. I think we can afford to give every American a $2,000 refundable tax credit. It could come through the place of employment, or if they weren't employed, it could just go to them directly. And um, we can, in fact, probably even be a little bit more generous than that and replace all the existing tax and spending subsidies. That would create certainty. It would be adequate uh, for most people. And, um, uh, and it wouldn't destroy jobs. One of the, uh, <clears throat> one of the questions, uh, I guess, from Mr. Richardson is not only, obviously, you would prefer something that went to your employees, but your company, since before you were born, has provided a health care at least at that level, haven't they? That's correct, Mr. Chairman. So your employees enjoyed exactly what was described as the problem of Obamacare, meaning, with the exception perhaps of 25-year-old adult children being covered, depending upon the state, you already provided a level of care that was what had justified the need for Obamacare. Isn't that right? Correct. So in a sense, you are a victim of overregulation when, in fact, you were not part of the problem. That is uh, how we feel. Well, when you look at those, those 21 new taxes, medical device tax, that is going to raise, raise cost. It is not going to help health care. When you look at, uh, at, at essentially a whole new tax on capital gains and other income, is any part of that going to help you build your business? No. It is just added to a lot of uncertainty and indecision. Now, <laughs> Mr. Frederick, you mentioned that, uh, and this was particularly interesting because I, I started off in manufacturing in, in Ohio, and a lot of I made a lot of products with my employers or my customers' tools. So I was often working with the tool and die shops uh, to create the tool that would be the least cost for me to then manufacture their products. If your costs go up and your tooling go up, uh, we'll forget about your 49 to 51 employees. Uh, what is the, likely, the likelihood that that German company will simply either move the tool making overseas or, in fact, move the entire production to another country? Most of our customers are large companies, and what they have the ability to do is outsource. And their market is the world. 
So we don't compete just against companies in the U.S. We compete against companies all over the world, China, India. Um, so they are going to source it somewhere else. Now, the reason they, they buy from us is because of good service, good quality. They can buy it in smaller lot numbers. They don't have to buy uh, container loads full of handles or something. But uh, without question, if we become, un and they are very price conscious, but uh, if our price gets out of line, uh, they go somewhere else, not, not in this country, they go somewhere else in the world to source it. Okay. Senator Wolf, uh, you certainly uh, made a good case for why you, uh, you support uh, Governor Romney's uh, bipartisan effort in, in Massachusetts. But let me ask you a, a different question. You compete in, down in the Virgin Islands and so on. I noticed your flights go into those places. If your cost of fuel, your cost of pilots, your cost of, of maintenance, your cost of Cessna, 400 series aircraft, if all of those go up, are you, in fact, likely to do less business, or can you simply pass it on? To a degree, we can pass it on, but if the costs go up significantly, obviously that does have an impact on business. So I would say the answer to that is it depends. I, I will say, though, that the variability of health insurance is a lot less than the variability of some of the other cost factors that we face, fuel being the primary one, if you look at that volatility. Sure. No, I understand the volatility of fuel, but, but no, no cost in America has, has equaled the in increased cost of health care, and I want to preface this in closing, before or after Obamacare. There is no question that health care cost led the cost increases in the years before Obamacare and, of course, in the years since it has been passed. So for any of you here, what is it in the President's health care, in, in ACA, that, in fact, in your estimation, will lower your cost of doing business? In other words, what in those taxes, what in those regulations, if anything, is actually going to lower your cost of health care for your employees? Anything? Okay. Is this for any of us? Well, I am getting no's from everybody, so I will give you, Senator Wolf, what is it in the President's health care that will actually cause health care costs to go down? Because nothing has happened so far. They would have to, they'd have to drop about 20 percent from where it is today to get back to where it was. Isn't that correct? For our company that has always provided the benefit, a portion of our premium dollars is going to provide health care for people who are uninsured. That is pretty accepted in the industry. So but, you were, but you were already in a State that prevented that. You already had all of that. So you wouldn't see any of that. And yet, Massachusetts, where you operate, you are paying additional taxes, even though you had already implemented effectively Obamacare. Isn't that correct? I think one of the reasons that our health insurance premium rates have stabilized is because we are not any longer cross-subsidizing the 16 percent nationwide that do not have health right, insurance, but, because but, in our commonwealth we right, are not. But your state, your, people in your state are seeing additional taxes, substantial additional taxes, $87 billion uh, from the increase in, in Medicare payroll tax alone, and, and the list goes on and on for a trillion dollars. Your constituents as a State Senator are going to pay that tax even though you were not part of the problem under Obamacare. Isn't that correct? It is the case that the increase in, in cost in the State budget since the implementation of this bill has been de minimis. And when I say de minimis, the cost no, no, has been uh, about Senator, one Senator, I appreciate that you are now a State Senator. Your constituents, though, are going to pay these taxes. The estimated $123 billion, $87 billion, $60 billion, $52 billion, $46 billion, these were all from taxes that Obamacare expects. The, the people who make appliances, parts for the medical industry that ultimately, you know, the, the thing that goes into your bones when, when you are having an artificial limb and so on, all of those are enjoying a tax that is, is expected to be billions of dollars. Your constituents, if they are manufacturing, are paying that, even though your State was not part of the problem. I recognize my, my time is up, and I recognize the ranking member for his opening question. Let me pick up where it uh, was left off there. Um, Senator, First of all, I, I want to thank you for um, I want to thank all of you for being here, and I want to thank you, Senator, and you and Governor Rom Romney for um, the Massachusetts law. And I mean that very sincerely. I'm not; it's not a political statement. 
is that I see the people who don't get health care. I'm assuming that when this law, when you all did this, there must have been a moral issue here somewhere. It seems to get lost up here. The person, the lady that came up to me in my community not long ago who had colon cancer and said, I have nowhere to go. We ended up sending her to the NIH. You know, or my neighbor who died, the last thing he said on his deathbed to his wife is, is Ruth, I got to get up out of here because we ain't got no insurance. Was that a part of the consideration? Because it seems to get lost up here. The, the fact that the people die, and I'm not, and, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm saying this for a reason. I'm trying to figure out, as a former businessman, I understand the other side of it too, trying to make sure that you keep costs down so you can make a profit, so that you can employ people. And I, I have no problem with the things that these folks have said, I'm, I, and I know you don't, because you, you understand. You are a business person just like them. In some kind of way, I am trying to figure out where, wh how did you all come to the conclusion that, first of all, you needed to do something? Was there a moral consideration in this? And do you believe you save lives? Do you believe you save uh, needless suffering and pain? And do you believe that it's been worth it. In some kind of way, we, gotta, we had to figure that out. I guess the question of who we are as a society. Uh, some of my constituents, somebody said to me in a, de a de debate, Cummings, uh, you know, if you, uh, you know, you ought to tell the people and apologize for voting for the Affordable, Affordable Care Act. And I told my constituents, I said, if you, if you expect me to apologize for not leaving somebody on the side of the road to die, then I'm the wrong candidate. You need to vote for somebody else. And I just wonder where did that come in? And I believe that Governor Romney had a compassion. There was some compassion there. And, I, and any time you're going to get 40 votes in the Senate, bipartisan, that's something serious. So, so, so help me with this. Thank you for the question. And as an employer, I will tell you that since the primary way to procure health care in this country historically since 1942 has been through employment, we have always seen that as a responsibility. I could tell you stories that would make you come to tears about our employees of ours who came to us with pre-existing conditions prior to this law who were not able to procure health insurance on our plan, or employees who became sick and had to leave our company and were unable to get insured after they left. The law in Massachusetts has fixed that, and I think that is right and I think it is compassionate. It is also smart business, so that I think part of it is a moral obligation that we have to make sure that everybody has access to both preventative health care and health care in crisis. And I think that we have a, a responsibility, A, as an employer, now that I am a senator, I see that responsibility carrying through to all of the citizens of the Commonwealth who I represent. And so when you hear the arguments, and, and I, know you, uh, I know you empathize with the comments of, of your fellow business folk there, I mean, and, and you the head of a chamber of commerce, is it, you were? Is that right? Is that yeah. what you said? Yeah. Um, you know, the thing that I guess you all, have, you all have tried it, and it seems to be working, but, I mean, what is the, and Mr. Goodman basically said all you are doing is moving money around, or something to that effect, whatever you said. I mean, do you agree with all that? I mean, can you talk about some of the things that he said in complaining about the plan and how it is? It's, he said just, just people getting the same kind of treatment. You heard the things he said, and I just want you to answer those. Well, a couple of facts in, in, in the statement which I would just like to address are correct. First of all, the statement was made that more Massachusetts business did not offer it after the plan, and that is not the case. Prior to this bill going into effect, 69 percent of the businesses in Massachusetts offered health care. At this point, 77 percent of all those employers that have more than three employees offer health care. So that has been a success. The other th statement that I would like to address is the statement about people still going to emergency rooms for, for primary care. Since enacting this legislation, we have saved $118 million by diverting folks from emergency room as their source of primary care treatment back to primary care clinics and primary physicians. So both of those aspects, I think, have been a success as well. And so that the fact that they, you know, are diverted 
from the emergency rooms. You know, I hear from my hospitals all the time their concerns and whatever. Uh, and I'm just curious. I mean, has that had a, an effect on their? I'm sure it has. Bottom line, and how does that affect the, the program overall? You well, follow I think me? If we get people to get treatment and preventative treatment prior to emergency rooms, it's going to ultimately cost less for everybody. Mm -hmm. So it's not only more humane, but it's also a more uh, cost-effective way to do it. As a business person who looks at efficiency every day in the business that we run, there is so much inefficiency in our health care system that just as important as addressing the access issue, which this bill does, we need to very aggressively go after the cost issue. There is a lot of low-hanging fruit to wring cost out of this industry while providing a better and more humane health care system. Now, do you all have a similar provision in your bill to the ones in the Affordable Care Act where if the insurance company uh, spends more than a certain percentage on things other than direct health care, that money has to be refunded to the uh, uh, insured? We do. That's a great question. Our target in Massachusetts is 90 percent, so that the insurance companies are expected to spend 90 percent or more uh, on, on what we call the loss, the direct loss or the, or the payment, the claims, and that would leave 10 percent for administrative. And is there a, so what happens if they go over? There is a rebate. I see. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman from Maryland. The Chair will now recognize the gentleman from Mich uh, Michigan, Mr. Wahlberg. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Richardson, uh, could you uh, inform the committee what White Castle's employee retention rate is? Yeah, we have tremendous loyalty among our team members. We're really uh, uh, proud to say that uh, we had only a 57 percent turnover rate among our hourly employees, but then with our management team last year, it was only 6 percent compared to an industry average probably closer to 25, 30 percent. So seemingly some significant satisfaction there. Does yeah, we are able to measure that as well, and we do that um, by doing surveys and, and measuring that engagement and do very well in that area. Where does your benefit package, specifically health care, come in on that? The biggest thing about our health care focus is uh, providing what we could call freedom from anxiety. So that is something we have been uh, focused in on since 1924. That benefit specifically is rated one of the highest in terms of why people come to White Castle and why they uh, continue to stay. Prior to uh, Obamacare's passage, businesses had significant concerns about providing workplace coverage. What was the primary concern of employers like you? Uh, the primary concern was uh, increasing cost as we saw the landscape changing and uh, big increases each year. Does the Patient Protection Affordable Health Care Reform Act alleviate any of those concerns? No. Fortunately to us, it adds more uncertainty because um, we can see, looking ahead to 2014, um, significant increases coming down the pike. Um, Ms. Miller, um, Wherever I go in my, my district in talking to employers, um, I hear concern about rising health care costs and, and Obamacare. Uh, you told, as, as reported here in CNN, you told them that, quote, we are afraid to spend because we don't know what the big, scary monster around the corner looks like. Correct. Uh, would you have invested and spent more if the health care law had not been enacted? Definitely. We are a company of 40 years that we have always invested money back into the business and spending in a way to grow our business and create innovation. And we would have we've never had the cash on hand we have today because we are not spending money, because we don't, we don't know exactly what that looks like before this came down, the penalty if we don't do anything of being $640,000 for us with having 320 employees. I have to make sure I have enough money on hand as this goes into play so that until we can figure out how to make this work, because it is not going to be an easy process to make these changes. Is there any estimate uh, that the Chamber uh, or any business organization you know of estimate of how much capital is sitting on the table, under the table, behind the not table? I have heard a number like that, sir. But I, I would bet it would be significant at this I'm point. Sure they could find that number. Based upon your experience. Back to you on that. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Goodman, um, do we know how many people will lose their health insurance because of the government takeover of health care? 
No, we don't, but it could be uh, as high as $80 million. $80 million. I assume you mean loser employer sponsored. Empl employer sponsored. Yes. Yes, it could be very high, much higher than the Congressional Budget Office has estimated. What, w taking that in consideration, what will be an overriding economic impact of the uh, takeover health care to our economy, to our businesses? Well, as I said, we are imposing heavy labor costs on every employer in America, and if they don't bear that cost, then they have to pay a pretty substantial fine. We have $500 billion in new taxes, which the way they are imposed is going to reduce investment, reduce growth, reduce output. And, um, uh, and as you point out, um, people are going to have to switch where they are getting their health insurance because employers are going to find, in many cases, it is just cheaper to pay the fine and send the employees to an exchange where they can get very, very substantial subsidies. Does this, does this potentially add, based upon the economic impact, add, add to a significant increase in debt crisis simply because of the health care reform bill? Well, the uh, Affordable Care Act is not paid for, and that is a point that hasn't been made yet in this hearing, that, that half the cost of the Affordable Care Act is paid for by cuts in Medicare spending. And yet the chief actuary of Medicare has said that if you go ahead and do this, you are going to have one out of seven hospitals go out of business before the end of the decade, and senior citizens won't be able to find a doctor. And the prediction, apparently, by the actuary's office and by the Congressional Budget Office, they don't put it quite this way, but they keep putting out these alternative forecasts, and what they are really saying is, we don't believe Congress will stick with this. You didn't really pay for this bill. Okay. <laughs> That is an ama amazing uh, balloon in the sky with all sorts of uncertainty, isn't it? Yeah. Except the certainty that we can't pay for it. Um, uh, Mr. Richardson, um, or um, any of you, I would be glad for you to address this. Uh, when asked what he believed that to be the single I see my time has expired. Uh, uh, Unanimous consent for more uh, for thirty seconds. If you want to ask uh, and answer one more, I question. appreciate that. Okay. Um, the co-founder of Home Depot, Bernie Marcus, responded when asked uh, what was the single greatest impediment to, to job growth today. He said the U.S. government. Uh, asking business people here at the table, would you agree with him and why? We would tend to agree because what we're seeing right now is more uncertainty than we've ever encountered. Um, I think as we look at the landscape. Um, this was an aggressive program in terms of um, health care reform. The cost of health care reform have come at the absolute worst time, and the fact that we can't even calculate what the costs are going to be make it impossible for restaurants like White Castle to be able to plan for the future. So you can't commit to opening new restaurants and going to new markets if you don't know what you're going to be paying a year and a half from now as far as your costs go. So we find ourselves in an unenviable position of having to make the unconscionable choice between violating our conscience or um, mortgaging our future in a way to continue to provide the benefit our team members have become accustomed to. So it is paralytic. Uh, I actually think that um, it is our single greatest risk right now for our business. Uh, we are in the country. We have nowhere to go. And we're borrowing four billion dollars a day. You, not not our company, obviously. And that's not a good long-term plan. And and if you don't address that seriously, uh, we're we're right with Greece, Spain, and nobody's going to bail us out. We're too big. My husband and I have had the conversation more than once that when he started this business 40 years ago, he thought it was about cleaning toilets and mopping floors. And today we have to spend a large percentage of our time dealing with government compliance and paying taxes and figuring that out rather than focusing on how to make our business better, to grow our employee base and take care of customers, to create jobs and to create more revenue. And it, it takes us away from what it takes to run a business. Thank you. Can we all answer that? It is up to the chairman, but I am willing to listen. Oh, yeah. Um, I think the question is, is, is the biggest threat to our growth, is it, is it over-regulation or is it government? Um, I operate a business in the most highly regulated industry in the country, which is the airline industry, and we have found that regulation is not what gets in the way of our growth. I will tell you, if I was had the opportunity to come down here and talk about how do we level and make predictable energy costs, for example, 
in an industry where there are profits being made hand over fist without any effort to make that a predictable cost, I would have showed up a lot earlier for that hearing. This is 3 percent of our company's expense, and it is not a significant mover relative to whether we continue to grow. And by the way, we have grown 75 percent as a company since 2007, since the law was enacted in Massachusetts as far as gross revenue. So the answer would be no. I do not think the regulation of health care is an inhibitor at all to our business growth. And finally. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. The Chair will now recognize the gentlelady from the District of Columbia, Ms. Holmes Norton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman. I, I really want to thank each and, and every one of you for your testimony. I have listened very carefully, and I think I have I understand what, what you are feeling, uh, uh, particularly uh, about uncertainty. Remember, we are talking about a bill, the major uh, uh, parts of which don't go into effect until 2014, and yet we are here trying to calculate how many jobs it makes or doesn't make. Um, um, the, um, I also appreciate your concerns about whether it will slow job growth, um, notwithstanding the CBO, which has repeatedly said that it will uh, slow the increase in the cost of health care. But I know that I want to ask Senator Wolf a, a set of questions. Um, you come from various states, Texas, as I understand it, Columbus, Ohio, Cincinnati, Ohio, Wisconsin. So you are pretty representative, at least some parts of the country. But I tell you, we have seldom had in the Congress a real-time example uh, as any kind of model when we have enacted legislation by which to measure uh, what we are doing. And that is what the State Laboratory of Massachusetts has given us. It has given us, as it turns out, a Republican model from a Republican governor uh, who made it a bipartisan bill in a Democratic state. It means he had to prove himself. Um, it is the model, as it turns out, as Mr. Wolf says, that the country has embraced since the early 1940s, which is, hey, look, just use the existing system, uh, preserve uh, insurance, and build around it. That is what that is. That is all that is. It is what we have always had. So let me ask Mr. Wolf, who has some real life experience from which we can draw some conclusions. Mr. Wolf, and uh, Senator Wolf, I am sorry, in your state, there is a free rider prohibition or penalty on both the employer and the employee, as I understand it. Is that not correct? So let me ask you straight away, um, did the employer mandate and the accompanying uh, penalty cause a drop in employer-based job uh, of, of health care or in jobs in your state? And if they didn't, why not? since all the predictions are for catastrophe on that score, why in the world didn't that happen in Massachusetts, if it did not happen in Massachusetts? Be, be, because in Massachusetts we are overcoming that with a lot of other uh, government uh, assistance through education and workforce training. I mean, it is a state that is looking very hard at our economy. We have cut taxes. In fact, this year we cut both income tax at a personal level and at a corporate level, part of the healthy economy story. But again, Massachusetts is eighth in job creation so far this year with almost 38,000 jobs created. We are third in uh, gross state product growth since 2007 when this bill was enacted. It is clearly not inhibiting business health and growth. And I will repeat what I said before, too, that when this bill went into effect, 69 percent of the businesses in Massachusetts with more than three employees gave this benefit, now 77 percent too. So it has incentivized more businesses to give this, and very few businesses are paying the penalty because most businesses are complying with the law. Well, the other, the other speculation, and again, I want to go to the real experience for a change. Uh, the Massachusetts experience seems to contradict uh, uh, according to your testimony, 
um, you had a 15 to 20 percent increase in health care before this bill, uh, your bill, took effect. And the last year, as I recall, as I read your testimony, your increase had gone from 15 to 20 percent down to 4 percent, uh, and that you were actually able to negotiate a 5 percent decrease. Would you explain that in light of the parade of horribles we have heard here? All speculation, all before the bill has gone into effect, as the Massachusetts bill already has. Yeah, it, it, the bill has allowed for premium rates to stabilize in Massachusetts. The personal experience of Cape Air, again, as you point out, is two years ago we were able to, re, to negotiate a 5 percent decrease in premium. And the last two years, the increases have been about 4 percent. Did the fact that you have a larger pool uh, of people in, in, who are in health care help to uh, bring down the cost of health care? This, this is Economics 101. <laughs> Smaller the pool, the greater the cost. Well, now again, you, you have a larger pool. Did that help to bring down the cost? It of did. And one of the things that Massachusetts has done is we have implemented a a pool opportunity for up to 85,000 employees for small business to actually get together and, and accumulate their employee groups so that they can go with a bigger number and try to get reductions. So we are also addressing the fact that, yeah, there is a scaling issue, which is that if you can put more employees together to negotiate for that, then the rates will come down. Um, uh, Senator Wolf, this may explain why, if you look at every economy in the world, when countries uh, choose to offer health care, and by the way, almost all countries do, even developing countries, they use not a system we use, we are respecting the old system with employer-based health care. They use some kind of single payer, Singapore, which is not exactly, which is perhaps everybody's example of a free, free market, unregulated economy, single payer, sometimes a single payer is employer-based, but it is always single payer. And the reason, I think, comes down to the fact is if you put the sick and the well and all of us together in one pool, the basic theory of insurance, the basic theory of economics is we bring down the cost for everyone. Thank you very much, Senator Wolf. Thank the gentlelady from the District of Columbia. The Chair would now recognize the gentleman from the great State of Oklahoma, Mr. Langford. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I have enjoyed all the conversation from both sides of the aisle today, uh, praising uh, Governor Romney. I will look forward to their support in November as well, and on the same voice on that. Um, I have also uh, appreciated some of the conversation about other countries. Uh, in, in my area, in Oklahoma City, let me tell a couple of stories. Um, in Oklahoma City, there is a surgical hospital there that does a flat fee surgery. Uh, it is a tremendous hospital, very popular. When they started several years ago, the owner of the hospital said the surprise that he had is once they posted their fees online and started competing and opened up, the first folks that started to call them were the Canadians who would rather fly to Oklahoma City, stay there, pay for the surgery, and fly home than wait six months for the exact same surgery back home. Uh, another story, there is a, a cancer radiation treatment center in Oklahoma City, two really fantastic ones that are there, stellar. 25 percent of their business is from the U.K., because we have more advanced cancer treatment in Oklahoma City than they have in all of the U.K. So while we talk about perspectives here, it is interesting for me to look at and say, uh, we will get some flat amount that everyone will get access to, but the world is still coming here, and the lines are apparently very long overseas, and those who have the money and can fly out and go cut the line get it, and those who don't suffer and wait. So the, the promises that are built into this uh, have been interesting to me to be able to track. The, the, the promise that you are going to be able to keep your health care. If you like it, you can keep your plan. Now we are hearing from the administration up to 80 percent of the small business plans will not be acceptable and will not be grandfathered in, up to 80 percent. Up to 64 percent of the large employer plans will not be grandfathered in and will have to, have to make some sort of change. The cost has changed in the last two years from $800 billion to $1.8 trillion in two years, and it has not been fully implemented yet. And now we hear from CBO that they estimate in the next 10 years 800,000 jobs will be affected by this, 800,000 lost jobs. Now, may I remind everyone, in June, 
our economy only created 80,000. So we are talking about 800,000 lost jobs. Now, my concern is, is that there seems to be some assumption that health care is complicated and difficult. And if we would only give it to the Federal Government, it would be so much easier and more efficient and faster. And I think that is where I struggle with the process on this. It, it, is, it is the thought that there is something that the States do that if the Federal Government did it, it would be better. If there is something that private business did, if the Federal Government it, did it, it would be better. And I just struggle with that, personally. Does, does anyone know of an example of, of a State regulation that went to Federal that was so much more efficient and cheaper and faster, or of a private business that when it was federalized it suddenly got cheaper and faster and more efficient? I don't either. And I am not anti-government, but there seems to be this assumption that we will be so much more efficient, it will be so much cheaper, it will be so much better if we will just federalize this. Now, was that a rhetorical question? No, it was an actual question. I, I do have an answer to that. And again, it is the industry that I am in. I cannot imagine air transportation commerce being regulated State by State. No, no, I, I can't understand that. Now, well, that is no, an answer to the no, question. No, no, here is the thing on that. There is a difference between setting the boundaries, State Highway Department, aviation, whatever it may be, and if instead we came to your business, as you mentioned before, uh, with health care costs or with energy costs. You mentioned that, the fluctuating cost of energy. If we went in and did a, a mandate on energy, we are going to lock in the fees. Uh, my, my question to you, you know, I am on the aviation subcommittee for transportation. I could bring up a bill for aviation and say, you know what, let's go into all the, because I don't like paying the different prices. I have noticed different months, different prices for aviation. I would like to lock those down and just have one price and I am going to set it. In fact, I am going to come to all the aviation groups and I am going to say, I, I don't like how much advertising you do. I see it all the time. It is a waste. So I am going to say 95 percent has to go to the passenger. I need 95 percent of the money, and you can keep 5 percent for administration. You would be ticked at that point because you run a great company, apparently, and you should have the flexibility to run a great company and provide a great service and compete and win. And the concern is that somehow if we federalized it, if we went into your company, not just set boundaries for safety, but went into not just regulating but running your company, it would somehow make it better. Now, I, I do want to ask a question, Mr. Richland. You, you brought up a, an interesting thing. You, you said four to 500 jobs have not been created because you all have hesitated on expanding business. Would you clarify that for me as well? Yeah. For the past several years, we have been looking to expand into new territory. So we have done market research to explore that. In uh, looking towards that, we are concerned about what our cost curves are going to look like, so we have held back on any expansion at this point. So right now you are just on pause until what? until you, we get 2014 and try to figure out what the costs are going to be and then try to see what moves from there, so at least two more years of pause? Well, we are a family-owned business in the restaurant industry, so by nature we are optimistic. Right. But I think um, we are really, really trying to sort out and understand. We know for certain, um, so it isn't speculation on our part, we can look and model out that our costs are going to increase more than 20 percent when it comes to health care. That is $7 million plus. Um, that is a lot of money that could go into to building new restaurants, creating new jobs, and providing more benefits for our team members. Yeah. So, Thank you. With that, I yield back. Thank the gentleman from Oklahoma. The Chair would now recognize the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Tierney. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to thank all of our witnesses for being here today. But, Mr. Well, Senator Wolf, I want to thank you in particular because uh, I, you are the one that has experience with a real program. You are a little bit like a skunk at a lawn party. Everybody else is talking about myth and fear and speculation. And then you throw a little cold water on it and talk about reality. But we go right back to the myth and fear and speculation because that narrative is something people apparently don't want to change. But the, you know, one of the things we talk about is what's been happening in our state, Massachusetts at least. So 64 million plus uh, residents in Massachusetts with Medicare have saved, I'm sorry, residents in Massachusetts have saved on their Medicare $64 million in prescription drug costs, right? Yeah. Right. 1,324,000 in Massachusetts with private health insurance have gained preventative service coverage with no cost sharing. Right? Uh, we have a better value for our premium dollar through the 80-20 rule. You have a 90 percent rule in your, in your law in Massachusetts. So an average of $140 for 85,000 families in Massachusetts, right? Uh, and we, uh, we have an ability to scrutinize the premium increases. Can you tell us a little bit about what the Governor did with the legislature's support on premiums? Well, I mean, I can, yeah, but I can also give you some real data, which is that when premiums are considered as a percentage of household income in Massachusetts, right. we are now 48th 
out of the 50, 51, out of the 50 states plus the District of Columbia, 48th as far as the percentage of premium relative to household income. And that has gone down dramatically since the implementation of this, of this law. So I was a former local chairman of the Chamber of Commerce as well. Do uh, you agree with me that as far as our small businesses and local level, this is good for them? I think that CNBC is about to announce this afternoon, I hope, that Massachusetts is considered to be the number one place in the United States to do business. If this, what we are talking about on a national basis, was so deleterious to the economy and to small business growth, how is it possible that the one State that implemented it would be named as the best State in the, in the country to do business? It just doesn't make sense. That won't deter anybody, though. But the uh, Ms. Miller, let me ask you some questions. You, you have a policy you say that you offer to your employees, correct? Yes, sir. What, how much on an hourly basis does your newest, uh, lowest level employer make? Nine eighty. Nine dollars an hour. Nine dollars an hour. So take home pay somewhere around six eighty, six seventy five. All right. And how much would their share of a, a premium cost for health care cost on a dollar basis? It's uh, twenty dollars a month, sir. Is okay. what our minimum is. So the six dollars if they work forty hours a week, what right. are they bringing home? Bring home net, yes. How much are they bringing home? About on, on a net basis on a weekly. I'm not a mathematician. Well, so forty up times six dollars, so <laughs> two hundred forty three hundred dollars or whatever. And your plan is limited, you said, right? Yes, sir. So limited in the sense is a big copay. No, small copay. Just uh, max is six thousand dollars a year, sir. Oh, and that's it. Yes, sir. So a lifetime cap and an annual cap. Correct. Deductibles. It's low deductible. I can't remember the number off the top, sir. Well, what do you think? But it's it like is a co copay to go to the doctors is like 50, ten to fifteen dollars. Out of that six dollar right. an hour job, all right. And the deductibles. Um, I only know that it's a six thousand dollar max a year. So, is it any surprise to you that eighty five percent of your employees don't take advantage of this this plan? Yes, sir. It is a surprise. Really? Because it covers basic health care. Okay. Well. I mean, I think that, you know, I have seen people that bring home that amount of money, and there isn't a lot left over for a plan with deductibles and co-pays and, and that kind of a share on it or whatever. So it is no surprise to me, and people that were in my chamber wouldn't be surprised, and, and Senator Wolf, I suspect people in your chamber wouldn't be surprised. Am I right? Sir, the cost would just, go up quite a bit higher with the new plan. Well, let me just suggest what the market was doing before we had the Affordable Care Plan. All right? In the last 10 years before we had the Affordable Care Plan, uh, premiums more than doubled a rate three times faster than wage increases. From 2004 to 2007, 12.6 million adult Americans, 36 percent of those who tried to purchase a policy from an insurance company in the individual market were denied coverage, charged a higher rate, or discriminated against because of preexisting condition. 8.6 million more Americans were uninsured, so it went from 38.4 million to 47 million. If we don't act, if we hadn't acted, it was estimated the cost of employer-sponsored family health insurance plan would reach $24,000 just by 2016. That would be an increase of 84 percent. Most American households would be spending 45 percent of their income on health insurance. Family premiums would be expected without the Affordable Care Act to rise on an average of $1,800 a year. So those people that work for you for six and a quarter or six seventy-five an hour would have to pick up an extra, extra amount of that every year, $1,800. 14 million more Americans would be expected to be uninsured, so it would go from 47 million to 61 million. Small businesses in the 10 years before we had a health care plan, the affordable health care, their premiums are rising at 129 percent. I know it because I saw it in my business. Senator Wolf, I suspect you saw it in yours. And Ms. Miller, I think you saw it in yours as well. If we hadn't acted on the Affordable Care Act, premiums would have increased more than doubling in most states and would have risen by 60 percent in the best cases and small businesses were projected to lose more than $52 billion in profits due to high health costs. So for the last 10 years before we had the Affordable Care Act, our national health care spending increased 90 percent. So if you want to see damage done uh, to our economy and to young people and what the effect it would have been, that would be it. Uh, and so, Senator Wolf, I want to say once again, I'll give you the last opportunity to wrap up here. That was the projection without a health care plan like the one in Massachusetts, the Affordable Care Act. With the plan of Massachusetts, what have you seen in reality? Well, b both our company but also statewide, as I said, we have seen the amount being spent on premium as a percentage of household income 
dropped significantly since the implementation of the plan. And I think that is probably the best measure. Because if you look at absolute dollars, you then have to adjust it for uh, different regions and the cost of living and all of that stuff. So I think the best measure is the cost to a family as a percentage of their household income. And I think in Massachusetts that has been a success story since the implementation. Thank you very much. Yield back. Sir, may I respond to your earlier question, please? Sure. It's your question. Give me the time, sure. Okay. Sure. Right now, our. I mean, I saw the young lady hand you the note. Would you like her to testify? <laughs> no, she from the she's, Chamber of Commerce? She's doing the calculator for me. She from the I, Chamber of Commerce? <laughs> yes, sir. Oh, of course. She's doing the calculation for me. Oh, right sure. now, I said our policies, our benefits cost between $20 to $30 a month, so average of $25 a month, 12 months is $300 a year cost right. for minimal coverage, but it's coverage. With the new plan, it would cost them $1,500 a year. Well, you don't have a new plan under this plan. It hasn't gone into effect yet. But it would be, sir. So it's your speculation? Yes, sir. That's my point. If you want us in reality, Senator Wolf is sitting right next to you. Thank you. Yield back. Chair would now recognize the gentleman from Tennessee, Dr. Desjardins. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm just sitting here listening to all these numbers rattle through my head. And, and uh, I mean, Massachusetts care just sounds almost too good to be true. Uh, we're, we're about to implement a law that, uh, in my experience in health care, cannot bring down costs when you are adding more recipients uh, and not ration care in, in some form or another. Uh, we, we've got to some, something's got to give when it comes to uh, the cost of health care because the Affordable Health Care Act does not do anything to address cost containment. Health care costs are rising, so I don't know how this is going to be cheaper. But we are fortunate to have a number cruncher on the panel, Dr. Goodman. Uh, maybe you can explain you know, whether or not Obamacare is really affordable for this country and why is uh, the care in Massachusetts so much better than what we are projecting for this? Well, I want to start with Mrs. Miller's uh, company and her employees. There is nothing in the Affordable Care Act that does anything to help her or her employees afford a $15,000 family policy. There is nothing. There is no new subsidy, no new tax break. It is just a law that says if you, she, doesn't, she and her employees can't come up with $15,000 for a health plan, they are going to be fined. How does that help anyone? It doesn't. Now, in Massachusetts, um, Again, the expansion, uh, the way they cut the uninsured in half was not by going out and forcing employers to provide a lot of new health insurance. They cut their health insurance, uh, uninsurance rate in half by putting most of the people in Medicaid and the rest of them are getting highly subsidized insurance from the State. So this isn't affecting employers very much. But also, we need to correct the impression that a lot of people are getting additional care because there are not. And a lot of people in this room are confusing health insurance with health care. I was in Massachusetts last year and I talked to a woman cab driver and I said, how is how's the health plan working? And she said, well, she is on Ma Ma Mass Health, which is Massachusetts Medicaid. She said, well, I had to go down a list of 20 doctors before I could find one that would see me. And I said, are you going down the yellow pages? She says, no, this is the list Medicaid gave me. You, you, you can't give people more health care if you don't create more doctors, more nurses, more clinics, or deregulate the market so that it can more efficiently provide services. So Massachusetts made the same mistake that Obamacare is making at the Federal level. In Texas, we have 25 percent of our population uninsured. Now, we can go put them all in Medicaid, but where are they going to find the doctors? Where are they going to get more care? They are not. And so we are creating a promise of more access to care, but we are not going to be able to deliver, and they haven't done it in Massachusetts. And I will repeat again, more people are going to hospital emergency rooms in Massachusetts today than ever before, and the same number of people going to community health centers are still going there even though they now are insured, and, and they are not getting more care. Um, um Senator Wolf, you, your company sounds fantastic. I, it's, I mean, when all these airlines are going bankrupt, you are just thriving and, and increasing profits, and, and that is wonderful. Congratulations. Uh, how many employees do you have? About 1,000. 1,000. And do you offer all these employees health care? They, they are all offered it. Some of them are covered on, on other plans, but, yes, they are all offered it. What does it cost you uh, approximately per employee to provide health care for them? For an the total policy or our portion of it? What your portion of it? An, an individual policy is around, is between five and six thousand dollars. Generally, we pay sixty percent of it. Okay. Well, you sound like a very shrewd businessman. So if you've got, uh, you, you said not all thousand of them are on there, but about six thousand. So you're spending, if you're insuring all of them, six million 
uh, a year in, in health care coverage? No, our, total, our total premium dollars are somewhere uh, just over $3 million. Okay. And that's a lot of 3 percent of your, of your company's correct. budget. Okay. Now, uh, what are you going to say to your accountants who come in and say, do you realize that if you pay the tax that President Obama is proposing, you can cut that cost in half? I mean, you are you're doing well right now, but what if times get tough? Are you going to keep those employees on that health care? Well, look, we, we think it is our obligation as an employer, since that is how human beings get health coverage, and, and I agree, we are confusing health insurance with health care, but the fact is health insurance is the gateway into health care. And we just don't think it is a humane workplace to have employees who either personally or family crisis drives them onto the street or into bankruptcy. So you think it is so a right we, to have health care? We will do whatever we have to do to continue to provide that for our employees. Okay. Uh, how about our other business folks here? Is, is that a similar experience you are having, Mr. Richardson? Um, Seventy-five percent of our team members who are eligible for health care, all of our full-time team members are eligible. Seventy-five percent participate in the program. Mm -hmm. Our cost is $30 million a year. Um, significant investment. We have been making a similar investment over the decades. Um, we have seen that cost increase. But for us, it is about the dignity of each person, mm -hmm. providing that as something that is part of that special relationship we have between an employer and an employee. I guess what we are concerned is, um, to us it hasn't been speculation, but it has been fear because we see a semi-truck of extra cost about three feet away about to hit us and every one of our restaurants and each one of our neighborhoods. So we are really struggling with how are we going to be able to make ends meet to be able to continue what we have done for almost 90 years. So it may be humane, but if your company is broke, you are not going to be able to provide any health care or wages. The, yeah, the choice I referred to earlier was that, yeah, this is a difficult uh, position we are in. All right. Well, my time has expired, and I thank the panel. Thank the gentleman from Tennessee. The Chair would now recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Senator Wolf, uh, first of all, um, I assume you represent Falmouth. Actually, no. The Senate President represents the great oh, town of Falmouth. Okay. So you are not quite my family state senator, but close. Um, you would like to represent Falmouth. I, I would love it. to represent yes. Falmouth. <laughs> Well, I, I am a fellow Bay Stater by birth and, uh, and uh, child rearing, and so I, I'm glad to have you here today. Um, I'm confused. Um, we heard unbelievably dire predictions about what would happen if the Affordable Care Act were adopted and if it were uh, to be implemented. Uh, would it be fair to say similar dire predictions about un unemployment, uh, investment, budget busting, and whether it was efficacious to begin with were similarly echoed in Massachusetts at the time of the adoption of Romney Care? Well, to some degree, yes. However, because it was a bipartisan effort, the message from government was we have come together, both parties, to do what we think is right for the citizens of the Commonwealth. And I think the message matters from government as we roll out a plan like this. Um, Senator Wolf, your business credentials, you are you're, you're not some wide-eyed lefty commie pinko, are you? I mean, <laughs> you, you were, in fact— Choose not to answer that question. <laughs> yeah, on, on the grounds that may incriminate somebody. But uh, you served as the chair of one of the chambers of commerce in Massachusetts, is that correct? Uh, I was on the board of the Cape Cod Chamber of Commerce for 15 years. I served as the chair from 2005 through 2007. And you are also or were a trustee of one of the largest mutual banks? Still am, yes. Still are? Yes. Well, other than that, you sound like a communist. Uh, <laughs> so um, those dire predictions that, came tr that, that some made and some are making now, what, what, uh, let me ask you this. Is it true that 98 percent of the residents in Massachusetts now have health insurance? It is true, yes. What was it before Romney Care was adopted? We went from about 80, I believe, 88 percent to 98 percent. Is there any other state in the union that has 98 percent health uh, insurance the, coverage? The, the rest of the country has, a bit, on average, 16 percent not employed. I mean, I'm sorry, not insured. Uninsured, yeah. Versus two in Massachusetts. That's correct. Well, the unemployment rate, though, must have skyrocketed because of this hobnail boot of government on the backs of business. The, un the unemployment rate has dropped uh, since the recession in 2009 from 8 percent to 5.8 percent. So you have actually been creating jobs. We have been creating jobs. Against all predictions. Well, um, premiums, 
premiums, health care premiums must have skyrocketed because we all know, as we have heard from testimony here today, health care costs are going to spiral upward no matter what we predicted, no matter what the you know, various experts predicted in the adoption of the Affordable Care Act. What happened to premiums after Romney Care got adopted in Massachusetts? As I said before, the premiums for us and, and statewide have leveled off and relative to other states are actually doing really well. Now, there is a debate going on about whether it is a tax or a penalty and, you know, as somebody with a little bit of a theological background, it is almost a little bit like how many angels can dance in the head of a pin. But um, in Massachusetts, I received an email from somebody close to me who said, um, in Massachusetts, the statute passed and signed into law by Governor Romney requires every Massachusetts resident to file a certificate with the annual state income taxes that they have to file, proving you have insurance. If you don't have insurance, then you get hit with a penalty. It is the exact same plan. Is that an accurate description, Senator Wolf? Yes, it is. Well, is that a tax or a fee or a penalty? Uh, that sounds to me like a semantic discussion, which I don't necessarily I don't have an answer for that. But. Well, certainly Governor Romney, when he was governor, vetoed this. No. He didn't? No. You mean he signed that into law? Yes, that was signed into law. Well, he criticized it at the time when he signed it, right? Not that I remember. Hmm. Well, um, would it be fair to say, is it your understanding that uh, when President Obama and the Congress, those of us who participated in the act, uh, use Massachusetts as a model for the National Affordable Care Act? Is that your understanding? Yes. The, the Massachusetts uh, law was used as a template, and I think there are a lot of similarities. There are some differences as well. In including an individual mandate? Yes. My time has expired, but I thank the good Senator for his testimony. Thank the gentleman from Virginia. The Chair would now recognize the gentleman from Idaho, Mr. Labrador. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, Mr. Wolf. You said something that's really interesting. The message matters. The government, when, when you rolled out the Massachusetts health care plan, you actually had bipartisan support for the plan. Isn't that correct? Yes. Don't you think that was one of the biggest mistakes that was made here in Congress, that they didn't look for a bipartisan solution to the health care crisis that we have in the United States? Instead, we looked for a one-party solution? I, Be honest about this. No, I can't. I cannot pretend to understand how this works down here. I can just tell you how it works in Massachusetts. But what did Governor Romney do in Massachusetts? He talked to the senators, to the Democratic leadership, because it was controlled by Democrats in Massachusetts, and it was able to find a bipartisan solution that he believed worked in Massachusetts. Isn't that what he did? The belief in Massachusetts that was the genesis of this plan was that as close as possible, every citizen of the Commonwealth should have access to affordable and good health care. But That's he believed the that the only started. way to get to that solution was by involving both parties. Isn't well, that correct? That is where the dialogue started. There was bipartisan belief okay. that every citizen of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts should have access to affordable Wait, which, which and is not my care. question. You are not answering my question. The, the, the belief was that in order to have a solution that would work for Massachusetts, you would need to have both parties actually work, not just one party working on the solution? And the answer is yes, I, th I think you already have said. Now, there was a study done by uh, Gogan from Stanford and Hubbard from Columbia that says that the Massachusetts, Massachusetts plan has caused health insurance to rise 5.9 percent more per year than the rest of the United States. Isn't that true? It may be true that the study says that. That is not what my numbers show. So you disagree with this study? I disagree with that study, yes. Dr. Goodman, can you talk about that study and can you talk about where the disagreement is here? Well, Massachusetts has some of the highest health insurance premiums in the whole country. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is right up near the very top. And uh, it was a very misleading statement by Senator Wolf when he divided by state income. It also was a high income state, but their premiums are among the highest in the whole country. Uh, they have not controlled health care costs, and they admit they haven't controlled And There is nothing in the Massachusetts health reform uh, project that even tries to control costs. But now they are threatening the state with, with a global budget. And what a global budget means is they are going to give you a certain amount of money and make you ration health care. That is what Massachusetts is very seriously considering right now. Okay. 
And uh, Senator Wolf is nodding his head no. Why, why is he, I mean, what, where are you basing your, your facts from when he's, uh, just Dr. Goodman, why, why is he nodding no and, uh, as you're making that Well, statement? John Gruber and everybody involved, including Governor Romney, admitted they didn't have any cost control uh, that they put in place. And, um, and, and they acknowledge that. Just, just as the Obamacare legislation has no, there's no cost control in the Affordable Care Act. They just push that aside. They have some demonstration projects, but the CBO has, has three times said that what you're doing in these demonstration projects is not going to control costs. So in Massachusetts, they're going to fall back on global budgets, and um, um, they've, they've been pretty open about that's the road they want to take. Okay, so you stated that Massachusetts actually has the highest health insurance costs. Is, is that correct? Yes, and, but they also had very high costs before the uh, Romney Care. Okay, and has this made it the lowest cost or the middle? No, no, no. It's still highest in the country. So near so, the very top. Okay, okay. Um, do, do you not agree, Senator Wolf, that Massachusetts has the, the highest health care costs? Massachusetts has some of the best teaching hospitals and research centers for medical care. Again, you're not answering the question. I, so, I know you're a senator and you're a politician, but just answer the question, please. <laughs> I'll consider that a compliment. Uh, Massachusetts, relative to its income, mm -hmm. has the 48th out of 51 states. So if you look at absolute cost, yes, oh, the but the cost of living in Massachusetts is overall higher. So relative to the impact on an individual family's ability to make ends meet, Massachusetts is the third best in the United States of America today. Because it has the third highest income, correct? Because as a percentage of family income, because the, high, the income is the highest in the, the third highest in the United States. So if you want to play semantics and play with the numbers, but the reality is that your health care costs are higher than 48 other states. Well, let me try it this correct? way. Massachusetts, 9.8 percent of a family's annual income is towards health care. The annual average now is close to 15 percent. But it's still I would the, rather the, live the, in Massachusetts then. That's good. And, and you're doing a good job representing Massachusetts. Thank you. But it's still the third highest in the United States. Isn't that correct? The, high, the cost of health insurance? We're going to keep doing this. It Just is, answer it, the question. It's a simple question. I could be wrong. I could be right. I you're will right. answer the question. You're correct. You're correct. Okay, I'll answer for him. <laughs> no, the, the question was asked to me. I'm going to answer it, if you will, please. Massachusetts, relative to income, is 48. I have heard you say that states. five times. That's, that is five the times you have said the same thing, but you're not answering the simple question that Dr. Goodman just answered, which is has the third highest cost of health insurance in the United States. That's all I was trying to ask. Thank you. Thank the gentleman from Idaho. The chair will now recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis. Mr. Chairman, um, Dr. Goodman, you mentioned at one point that uh, people were still going to emergency rooms and community health centers. And I don't know necessarily about the emergency rooms, but I think they are still going to the community health centers because they get good care and, and they can afford it. I think that they are one of the best approaches to providing health care, especially primary care, to large numbers of low-income people that we have known in this country. Uh, Senator Wolf, let me read portions of an op-ed that Jonathan Gruber wrote, and I am going to quote, he worked for Governor Romney on his health plan. He is a, a MIT economist. And I am reading directly what he said. He said that lately critics of the Affordable Care Act have been promoting a different claim, that Obamacare is a job killer. Specifically, they say it will stifle the economy with regulations and taxes. But the economic literature doesn't support this claim. If anything, it suggests the opposite. The Affordable Care Act will boost the economy. Senator Wolf, does the Massachusetts experience support the conclusion that the ACA will boost the economy? 
my experience in Massachusetts, as I said in my testimony, is that it has not had a deleterious effect on the economy or in job growth in the Commonwealth. And the statistics that we look at would bear that out, sir. Well, he went on to say that the law will result in more than 30 million additional Americans getting health insurance. But what few realize is that by expanding insurance coverage, the law will also increase economic activity. Many uninsured consumers are forced to set aside money in low-interest liquid accounts to make sure that they have enough to cover unexpected medical costs. With the security provided by health insurance, they can feel free that money up for consumption that is much more valuable to them. More purchases of consumer goods will provide short-run stimulation to the economy and more hiring. Would you agree with this comment? Yes. I also agree, and I, I find it difficult to understand what people are talking about when they talk about the increase in need for health care, given the fact that many more people will be seeking it, that has to increase the economy. And if it doesn't right away, I, I see, Dr. Goodman, you are shaking your head. It is amazing to me that as more people seek health care, as more people live longer and receive care, as more doctors and nurses and medical technologists and other health personnel are needed, how could this not increase the economy? Well, in the first place, there is no provision in the Affordable Care Act to create more doctors, more nurses, more health care. It is all about health insurance. It is not about expanding the supply of medical resources. And you have to remember that every dollar spent on the Affordable Care Act on health insurance for those 30 million people is a dollar that has to come from somewhere else. It is a dollar you take away from the seniors on Medicare, the disabled on Medicare, or the device makers, or the, the people who go to tanning salons. And, and when you take dollars away from those people, then they are not spending the dollars. So it is just I am surprised that Jonathan Gruber would say what he said, because I do have respect for him. But, but just shifting money out of one pocket and into another does not increase total spending. As people are living longer, as they are consuming consumables, as they are using food, as they are using housing, does not this expand the economy? Not if the dollars that they spend are taken from somewhere else. And there is also nothing in the Affordable Care Act that is going to make people live longer, because there is nothing in the Affordable Care Act that expands the supply of health care. Well, if they receive more health services, and they are adequate and good, I think they will live longer, as I have seen people who die prematurely for lack of care. And I yield back. I thank the gentleman from Illinois. The chair would now recognize himself for or five minutes of questions. Uh, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich, um, who, uh, incidentally enough, is uh, widely viewed as being a very genial, very popular uh, member of Congress who is uh, very devoted to his uh, political ideology. Uh, I happen to disagree with his political ideology, but nonetheless, he is very devoted, very genial man. And I was listening to his opening statement, and he talked about the virtues of universal care. And it just struck me while he was talking that it is counterintuitive to believe that an entity can give you something and also not place limits on how you can use it or extract commitments from you on how you can use it. It is just counterintuitive. I mean, there, cliches are cliches for a reason, uh, because they are universally accepted as being true. And the cliche that there is nothing free in life is true. So against that backdrop, uh, let me ask you uh, this, Senator Wolf. Are there things that states can do that Congress cannot do? 
I would say that there are appropriate roles for states to play that are not appropriate at the federal level, and that is an opinion, but yes. Well, I mean, it is an opinion that was also shared by our framers. Uh, there are things, I mean, ours is a limited uh, powers government. Uh, the Constitution limits the powers of the Federal Government, and that is why we have a Ninth and Tenth Amendments. So whatever is not specifically given to the Federal Government is reserved either to the people or to the States. So you would agree with me that there are things that the State of Massachusetts can do that Congress cannot do? Yes, I would agree with that. All right. Can Congress tax Mr. Richardson's business? for not providing dental insurance to his employees? I think a higher power than I, which would be the Supreme Court of the United States, has answered that question. No, I said dental insurance. I didn't say health insurance. I am trying to see what the limits of, of, of the power of the Federal Government are. I mean, the Supreme Court, and, and you are right, it was a 5-4 to four decision. I think it is tragic that the decisions that impact generations of Americans to come, whether it is a capital punishment decision or whether it is it's a health care decision, would be de decided by one person. But, but nonetheless, you are right, to the surprise of many conservatives, Chief Justice Roberts provided that fifth vote that said that, that while we can't make you do it, and that is important, if you read his Commerce Clause analysis, we cannot make you do it, but we can tax you if you do not do it. So my question is, can Congress tax Mr. Richardson's business for not providing dental insurance to his employees? My belief is, based on the experiment in Massachusetts, which has been successful, and based on the Supreme Court ruling, that it is appropriate for the Federal Government, for the Congress, to pass legislation that both covers health and dental. And, and by the way, I have always seen dental care. It is the one orifice that everything that enters our body goes through. And I have never understood why dental care is not considered as part of health care. Right. So, yes, I, be I believe it is appropriate. Just, just so we are clear, good oral health is tantamount to good overall health. I um, will spare everyone the studies that support that. But you believe it is within Congress's power to tax employers who do not provide dental insurance? It is not, not a trick question. It is the same question I'm, I asked I'm you. Just, I just want to make sure that the answer is yes. Uh, the, I believe that the law as written is appropriate for Congress to enforce. That is well, my answer to that question. Let me ask you this. You are choosing the word tax. I am not using the word tax. I am not choosing to use it or the word penalty or anything. What? Because as I said before, to me that is semantics. I believe the implementation and enforcement of this law is appropriate at the Federal I, level. The only, reason I, the only reason I use the word tax is because that is the only power by which Congress can do it. The Supreme Court said you can't do it on the Commerce Clause. One of my colleagues asked you about your line of work, and you correctly cited the Commerce Clause as the reason that we don't have 50 different sets of systems for, for air traffic control and for airplanes, because it is inherently interstate commerce. The, the, the Supreme Court specifically rejected that analysis. There are limits on what Congress can do via the, the Commerce Clause. I am trying to decide whether there are any limits to what government can do via the Tax Clause. And I think you would agree with me that exercise and good diet are tantamount to good health. So can Congress tax Mr. Richardson for not providing a free gym membership to his employees? And if not, why not? I hate to keep frustrating you people by saying the same thing over. I'm not frustrated. Over again. Okay. It doesn't frustrate. I'm me. going to answer you the same way I did before, which is I believe, based on the law passed and signed by the president and the Supreme Court ruling, that the federal government has the right to pass and enforce the law that is now the law of this land and has been sanctioned. But I, I, I'm not being argumentative. I, I'm genuinely trying to. To, to determine what limits, if any, you believe exist on Congress's authority to dictate to businesses what they have to do. You are a business owner, a successful one, which I laud you for. My question to you is, those of us sitting here, can we tax you 
for not providing a free gym membership? Are there any limits on what we can do in Congress? Mr. Chairman, point With of respect to health care. Just a point of clarification? Yes, sir. Are you questioning Senator Wolf as a constitutional legal expert? Because I, don't, I wasn't aware that was his background. I thought he was an well, airline. I am not a constitutional legal expert, so it would be impossible for me to ask any questions about that. I am asking him as a businessman if he believes, I think he made, and I stand to be corrected by the general from Massachusetts, I think he made reference to the recent Supreme Court case. I don't think you have to be a constitutional legal expert to understand it. If so, I wouldn't have been able to read it. Well, I guess my I'm, question was, he made a reference to the case as to what is existing facts. Now, you are asking my hypothetical on something that would take, I think, a legal scholar perhaps to answer. But I will let him well, answer that I, one. I just look, curious he, what the value of his opinion was going to be. He has been markedly more successful in life than I have been. So I think he is able to answer the question. And if he can't, then he will say what all witnesses say, which is, I can't answer the question. It is not a trick question. I, I, I am genuinely trying to understand the intersection between government power and you represent a state. We represent the uh, Congress, the intersection between state power, federal power, and personal responsibility. And it's not, it's not a trick question. And if it comes across as one, I apologize to you. I, I, I want to know what are the limits to what we can do next session to your business, to your business, to your business. If exercise is good for you, why can't we tax you for not doing it? My answer to that is that the and what interested me and what got me into politics after a successful career in business is much more about how we can partner the private sector and the public sector, not a question of limitation, but looking for opportunities to work together to provide the future. And that involves health care. In my case, it involves transportation. It involves a whole slew of issues. Some of those will be challenged as we move forward, public and private sector together, and that is appropriate. There is a process to do that. This is part of that process, and I am very fortunate and grateful to have been a part of it. My time is up. I would now recognize the gentleman, my friend from Kentucky, Mr. Yarmouth. I thank the chairman. Uh, I appreciate the testimony of all the witnesses. Mr. Richardson, I want to especially welcome you and thank you for nourishing me through most of my life. I happen to represent a district that brags about having the largest White Castle store in, Castle number seven. in the country, so <laughs> glad to see you here, and I appreciate your testimony. Uh, Senator Wolf, you mentioned during your uh, response to a question, you said you want to make sure you will continue to do this as long as you can, because this is how people get their insurance. You are speaking specifically of the United States. I assume that is the historical pattern, or at least in modern history, in the United States. That is correct. Right. And, and Mr. Frederick, you said, um, uh, you referenced something about, um, you said, we're, well, you talked about where in, you, I think your quote was, you said you would prefer to see a market-based health care system, health care insurance system. And you said um, it works everywhere else. I assume you were talking about in other segments of the economy and not in other geographic jurisdictions, since uh, it, works, it works in this country. And as long as we have a free market with uh, limited uh, controls, it works just fine. You, now, what would you describe as the system we have had up, up until now? Would you have For health care? Yes. Uh, it is a, um, a system that uh, uh, developed out of a bad, bad choice, trying to uh, regulate uh, uh, the amount that people could pay in wages in 1942 during the war. And that is what started this. I mean, we, didn't, we don't have the same problem with uh, home care or auto, auto um, I mean, home insurance and auto insurance. And you have to ask, why? Why is it so different? And why are we here talking about how difficult it is to control cost when it is so obvious how you control cost? You don't have the, the user of the service buying the service. It is that simple. The user of the service is me if I am sick. The buyer of the service is the insurance company or or the, uh, and you don't have that. It, it is the only way this will ever get fixed. Doesn't the free market theory rely on an equal amount of power in the, the buyer and the seller? Um, you can't have a truly free market 
if demand is something you can't control. Is that correct? Well, I mean, would you agree or disagree? Oh, I disagree. I, I, I disagree. So I when think you're sick or you're in an accident, uh, you have the same freedom to make intelligent choices as when you're well. You mean if I'm, if I'm uh, awake? Uh, so I, I assume somebody is going to take me to a hospital. Well, exactly. That's the yeah. point. Do you know of any place in the world where there's a free market health care system that you could point to as evidence that what you would prefer to see is effective? Yeah, you see islands of free market health care. I mean, you see uh, 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 Singapore, I think, has a hospital where people fly to. Thailand has a hospital. Uh, or, or Where people fly to, but the citizens of Singapore no. are under a government-run, operated agree. system. Correct. But that, but that is the indication of what a free market will do. I mean, so why not use it? I don't know. I don't get the fact that that uh, that just because it's health care, that the government has to run it. It doesn't run anything well. The question is not whether the government has to run it, but the question is whether the free market can organize it effectively. And there has never been a situation that I have been able to find and you have been able to indicate to me that there is evidence that that can work. Other than the rest of the entire economy? Exactly. There is, really? So yes. this is just a special thing that, that, that there, there are many uh, people just who actually doesn't believe, work? There are many people who actually believe that. If you, if, if well, it sure, it sure doesn't uh, seem to be working, does it? No, it is not working. I, I happen to agree with uh, Congressman Kucinich, I am a single-payer person. But, Ms. Miller, I want to ask you a question as, as well. You talked about a very small number of your employees can actually, actually use the insurance system, avail themselves of it because they can't afford it? No, they choose. They can afford it. Our employee base averages a $10 an hour rate. Mm -hmm. So that is higher than a lot of the other cleaning companies that only hire part-time employees. We went to full-time employees so that they could have health insurance. We found policies that cost between twenty to thirty dollars a month, so it is. Okay, I misunderstood policy. that. You, you, but you talked about some that. Uh, There's only six percent of our employees. Only six percent who choose. choose oh, okay, I was I was actually correct. looking at the other other direction. Can I ask one further question of Dr. Goodman? You talked about twenty five percent of Texas residents being uninsured. Uh, you said that without any indication that that's a bad thing. Uh, what happens to those 25 percent who are uninsured when they get sick? Do they die, do they suffer, or do they use the same health care facilities and essentially have a subsidy, uh, let the rest of the people subsidize them? Well, they use safety net institutions, uh, just like they do everywhere else. Right. Um, I don't advocate that. I mean, I, I, I like the idea of the universal refundable tax credit that allows everybody to have private insurance. And um, may I respond to the free market for health care? <laughs> the international market for medical tourism is a free market, and it is growing very fast. And uh, Thailand is competing in it, India, Singapore, but also we are getting closer to home. We also have within the United States a domestic uh, medical tourism market, and that is what the Canadians are participating in. When they come here, they, get, they pay half of what you and I would pay for a knee replacement. And they get package prices and they can compare prices and compare quality. Cosmetic surgery, that is a free market. LASIK surgery, that is a free market. Minute Clinic is a free market. So there, there are many individual health care markets that give you an indication of how a market can work in health We were only talking about elective procedures and procedures that people could afford, none of us would be here. This wouldn't even be a conversation. Yes, but I think. It, uh, if everyone, the gentleman can conclude, okay. All right. go ahead, please. Yeah. Uh, if, if we gave everybody a refundable tax credit and gave them financial means to have decent catastrophic coverage and a health savings account, then people would have the wherewithal to participate in a free market for health care. How much would that cost? I think we can replace all the existing tax and spending subsidies with a tax credit that is, say, $2,500 for an adult, maybe $8,000 for a family. And, and that is enough. Thank you. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Uh, I might note as a native Clevelander like uh, Mr. Kucinich uh, that, in fact, the Cleveland Clinic is an example where they are not taking emergency rooms, they are really not taking health care insurance, but people are flocking there from all over the world. The, the private system does work if you either have excellence or a low cost. But, uh, 
Mr. Kucinich probably will go to the Cleveland Clinic if he needs really great care. Uh, he will not go to Canada. Uh, with that, I recognize the former chairman of the full committee, Mr. Towns, for five minutes. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I um, appreciate uh, you having this hearing. Uh, let me begin with, uh, by asking you, Mr. Richardson and uh, Mr. Frederick uh, and Ms. Miller, um, is there anything that you like about the Affordable Care Act? Is there anything? Thank you, Congressman. I think for us, um, it's always been about the dignity of the individual. So our founder, Billy Ingram, started our business with that in mind. He wanted people to have freedom from anxiety. So as uh, we developed and grew the business, that was a primary focus in terms of how do we provide that in any way we can. That freedom from anxiety in 1924 started with a health insurance plan. After that, we came up with a defined benefit pension plan along the, uh, the years, and then a profit sharing plan. And then each year we take a percentage of sales up to 1 percent and give that back to team members because we wanted to have that be part of everything that we were doing. So when we look at the Affordable Care Act, what we see is a wall that is being placed between ourselves and our employees because we have been able to have that conversation with them on a daily basis. Uh, every year we do surveys to find out what is on their mind. We listen intently. We modify those benefits and we have done that over time. Now we feel like there has been a barrier placed between us that tells us how we have to do that, something we have been doing very successfully. It almost feels like we are trying to communicate with uh, orange juice can and string versus being able to go direct like we were. And, and that is what has us concerned, um, because as we are looking to the future, we are very concerned about the cost implications that this has for us and our ability to continue to do that. Uh, we are put into a bit of a box where really the only way that we can continue to offer the benefit that our team members have come to depend upon us for and that we have a great relationship with them on is to reduce the quality of, of the benefit. So to us, it seems like we are walking around in Paradox Alley just trying to understand it. Thank you. Uh, my answer is no. There is nothing about it. And uh, to me, it is a, a step in the wrong direction because I, I believe the only solution to this is a market based system, and it is just moving away from that. You are not impressed with the uh, testimony of Senator Wolf, who indicated that 98 percent of the people in uh, the state of Massachusetts are now covered? You are not in, uh, that did not impress you in any way? Not a bit. I, I, I seriously doubt the numbers. I didn't study Massachusetts, but I think we're playing with numbers here. And that's easy to do and makes statistics look real good, but I don't believe it. You know, Mr. Chairman, I think that what we have here is fear. You know, I think people uh, you know, who uh, really have not had any dealings, because this has not been implemented. And I think that there's fear here. And, and when I listen to Senator Wolf, and who's had experience with this? I mean, he is now living it, and of course, uh, and what he's saying to me, uh, you know, is very different from what I'm hearing coming from uh, all of you, Mr. So, Towns. Yes, Mr. if I may answer that also, you're right. I have a lot of fear about this plan. I don't know all the details, but when they tell me that I have three options, basically, I can get health insurance for all my employees under this plan, and it would cost me, based on the numbers put out there, $1.4 million. I am a cleaning company. I don't get the kind of rates that airlines can get in Cape Cod. I am a cleaning company in Cincinnati, and I think I average and represent more businesses than an airline in Cape Cod would represent. I also have the opportunity to go to all part-time employment, and that doesn't help my employee base, because then they would have to have two or three jobs to be able to cover their cost. Or I could drop it and pay just the penalty or tax or whatever you want to call it, and that would cost me and still $640,000 that is not in my budget anywhere. I, I do have fear. Our focus has been for the past 20 years to improve the quality of life of our employees, to encourage them to go after the dreams, improve their quality of life, and do what they want in their life. They have to have a job first before they can help worry about the health care. So, yes, yes, sir, you are right. There is a lot of fear here. Well, let me just run down a, a couple of them, Mr. Chairman. I need just 30 seconds. Um, many small business owners across the country have expressed strong support for the Affordable Care Act. Let me just give you a couple of examples. For example, Mike Roach, the co-owner of Paloma 
Clothing in Portland, Oregon, said this, and I quote, despite everything I've heard said about the Affordable Care Act, what I've never heard anyone argue about is the tremendous problem health care has been and continues to be for small businesses. The costs have been crushing. If nothing was done about health care costs, we would either have to cut benefits or lay some of our employees off, neither of which we want to do. The fact of the matter is the new law has already started helping us. Overturning the law now would not help us, it would hurt us. We want the law fully implemented with support from across the board. And then Mr. Wolf, uh, uh, who have uh, uh, heard account of, he said, let me give you another example. Betsy Burden is the owner of King's English Bookshop in Salt Lake City, Utah. Here is what she said, and I quote, Before health care reform passed, I faced a very demoralizing decision to either drop my business health plan or lay off employees to contain costs. But we received tax credits through the Affordable Care Act, which took that decision off the table. We are able to afford our insurance and have not had to lay off any of our value employees. And this is uh, from Ken Weinstein, Mr. Chairman, and I will yield. Oh, no, take all the time you want. I, I just, it is interesting that a Federal subsidy is, is, is how the bookstore uh, was able to stay in business. Well, well the point is I guess if we subsidized it, everybody, about, it would be perfect. We are talking about creating jobs, aren't we? Well, that is a job that is created. I think if this is what this is about, I mean, if I, I want to make certain I am at the right hearing. Absolutely, as long as the okay. Chinese will keep loaning us the money. Yeah, right. At this, Ken Weinstein, owner of Trolley Car Diner in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and I quote, anyone opposing the new law, listen to this, obviously does not understand small businesses. Small businesses could not afford the system under the status quo. Health care reform was needed to help bring down costs and level the playing field with large businesses. Mr. Wolf, a study commissioned by Family USA and the Small Business Majority found that more than 3.2 million small businesses employing 19.3 million workers across the nation will be eligible for this tax credit this year. To me, this sounds like small businesses are finally getting the help they need. So I want you to say, first of all, Mr. Wolf, Senator Wolf, I'm sorry, that I really appreciate you know, your sharing with us today. And I think that you are helping us a great deal because you have been involved in it now, you have lived it, and of course uh, uh, you understand it. And I think that once we get over the fear and we can uh, recognize the fact that the Supreme Court has spoken, I mean, that's, they have spoken, and you are right. In his hypothetical question to you, I think the only thing you should have added is that the Supreme Court has spoken and that when that happens, that is the law of the land. And I yield back. I thank the gentleman. I would now ask that the GAO report of May, 12, or May of 2012, Small Employer Health Tax Credit, Factors Contributing to Low Use and Complexity, be placed in the record. Uh, Mr. Towns, uh, this, in fact, is where it is shown that because of the complexity, less than a quarter of those anticipated in what you just read ever uh, took advantage of it. In fact, uh, the program, that is a good example of an abysmal failure where you have to fill out at least seven different forms in order to uh, uh, take advantage of that credit. So most companies have not done it. Uh, but I appreciate the fact that it had good intentions. Perhaps we could work to fix it in these waning days. Yeah, I think we need to have another hearing and eliminate the forms. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, this is why we were such good friends during your chairmanship. As we close, I, I, I certainly I would like to thank our witnesses. I would like to thank my good friend, Mr. Towns because, in fact, during his tenure as chairman, we did work hard to try to reduce a lot of forms. Like most Federal officers, we try, we fail. All of you as employers know that, the one, including Senator Wolf, the one thing government is not good at is reducing the complexity of paper filing. And if we go electronic, we still manage to have you have to do redundant entry. Uh, I might note in closing, General President George Washington died while being bled. 
His doctors felt that they needed to bleed him more, so they did. In retrospect, they probably bled him to death. The, uh, the American people are going to be taxed heavily for this program that has no cost controls. That ultimately is going to be one of the questions is, can America's competitiveness sustain a system that is well intended as, uh, as the President's uh, flagship health care program is, ultimately has no cost controls, taxes in at least 21 additional places, and is likely to run up the cost? Senator Wolf, I have only one thing for you and one question in closing because I am the keeper of the record. Could you please cite the source of 98 percent of all Massachusetts being uh, insured? As we say in pilot lingo, stand by one. Yes, sir. <laughs> People loved it so much we need to get that in the record. And it is an important number, so I want to make sure we give you the right citing, so just stand by. Right, because we have been looking at the 2006, the 2010, and, and we don't get close to that number. So this uh, is the Massachusetts Taxpayers Foundation, Massachusetts Health Reform Spending 2006 through 2011, an update on the budget buster myth by the Mass Taxpayers uh, Foundation. Okay, but I would ask unanimous consent that be placed in the record without objection, so ordered. Uh, I believe you have all done a very good job of making clear what you find in your businesses. The reason we have had a second hearing in which we had business people specifically on this health care initiative is that ultimately the success or failure will be found in your balance sheets. If we are right on what is your right, um, you are going to see higher costs and lower profits. If they are right on your left, we will all be pleased that, in fact, a health care initiative worked as well as Senator Wolf believes it has in Massachusetts. I, for one, will join with my good friend, Mr. Towns, and say I hope Senator Wolf is right. And with that, we stand adjourned.